بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله محمد وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته الرسالة القشيرية Abu Yazid said, for 30 years I have been praying, and each time I prayed, I felt in my inner self as if I was a Zoroastrian who sought to cut his girdle. I heard Muhammad bin al Hussein, may God have mercy on him, say. I heard Abdullah bin Ali say. I heard Musa bin Isa say. My father told me that Abu Yazid once said, when you see a man who is endowed, with miracles to such an extent that he can sit on the air, do not be deluded by him until you have tested his attitude towards what is permitted and what is prohibited, his observance of the legal rules and of the divine law. Ami al-Bastami al-Bistami said on the authority of his father, one night Abu Yazid went to a hospice in order to recollect God's name on one of the walls of that hospice. He stayed there until dawn without uttering a word. I asked him about this and he answered, while there, there had passed through my mind a rude word that I once uttered in my childhood, and I was ashamed to mention God, may he be blessed and exalted. Muhammad, Abu Muhammad Sahel, bin Abdullah al-Tustari. He was the greatest, he was one of the greatest Sufi masters. He had no peers in his age in regard to devotional acts and pious scrupulosity. He performed many miracles. He met Dhul Noon al-Misri during the year when he when he came to Mecca on the on a pilgrimage. It is said that he died in the year 283 although some say it was in 273. Sahel said, when I was three years old, I used to stay awake during the night watching my uncle Muhammad bin Sawar perform his prayers. He kept vigil during the night. He used to tell me, go away Sahel and have a sleep. You are distracting me. I heard Muhammad bin al Hussein, may God have mercy on him say, I heard that Abu al-Fat, Yusuf bin Omar, the ascetic, sa said, I heard that Abdullah bin Abdul Hamid say, said, I heard that Ubaidullah bin Lu'lu say, I heard that Omar bin Wasil al-Basri recounted about Sahel bin Abdullah that he told him, one day my uncle asked me, don't you remember God who created you? I asked him, what can I rem how can I remember him? He said, say by your heart as you move around in your clothes, without, however, moving your tongue. God is my watcher. <clears throat> I said this for three nights. <clears throat> then I told him about this and he said to me, say this seven times during the night. I said this, then told him about this. He said to me, Say this 11 times during the night. I said this and I felt the sweetness of this in my heart. After one year, my uncle told me, keep on doing what I taught you and continue to do this until you enter your grave, for this will benefit you in this world and in the hereafter. I kept doing this for many years and I felt the sweetness of this in my innermost heart. One day, my uncle told me, Sahel, how can a man with whom God is always present and whom he always watches and observes commit a sin? So stay away from sin. I used to seclude myself from people. Then my parents sent me to a Quranic school. I told them, I fear that my internal concentration on God might dissipate. Make arrangements with the teacher so that I would come to him for a short while, study with him, and then come back. So I began to go to the school. I learned the Quran by heart 
when I was six or seven years old. I was fasting constantly and ate nothing but barley bread until I turned 12 years of age. When I turned 13, I came across a problem and asked my family to send me to Basra so that I could inquire about it. I, I arrived in Basra and began to ask local scholars about it. However, none of them was able to satisfy me. Then I left for Abadan in order to meet a man known as Abu Habib Hamza bin Abdullah al-Abadani. Al I asked him about this problem and he answered me. I stayed with him for a while, benefiting from his teaching and imitating his good manners. Then I returned to Tustar. There, my only meal consisted of a sack of barley that one could buy for one dirham which I ground and from which I made bread for myself. Every night before dawn, I ate of this just one ounce without salt or seasoning. Thus one dirham was enough for me for a whole year. I decided to fast for three nights and to break my fast on the fourth. Then on the fifth, then on the seventh, then on the 15th. In this way, I spent 20 years, whereupon I began to roam the land until I again returned to Tustar. There, I used to stay awake all night. I heard Muhammad bin al Hussein say, I heard Abdul Abbas al-Baghdadi say, I heard Ibrahim bin Firas say, I heard Nasr bin Ahmed say, Sahel bin Abdullah al-Tustari said, every deed that the servant of God performs without imitation, be it obedience to God or disobedience, is done to please his own self, whereas every deed that he performs in imitation of the Prophet وسلم, or his companions is painful to the soul. Abu Sulaiman Abdurrahman bin Atiyah al-Darani. Daran is a village near Damascus. He died in the year 215. I heard Muhammad bin al Hussein say, I heard Abdullah bin Muhammad al Razi say, Ishaq bin Ibrahim bin Abi Hassan told me, I heard Ahmed bin Abi Abil Hawari say, I heard Abu Sulaiman say, He who is doing good during the day will be rewarded during the night, and he who is doing good during the night will be re rewarded during the day. He who, is, he who has relinquished his carnal desire, God will remove it from his heart. For God, most high, is too noble to torment the heart with carnal desire after it has relinquished it for his sake. According to the same chain of transmission, he also said, when desire for this life settles down in the heart, desire for the hereafter departs from it. I heard Sheikh Abdu, Abu Abdurrah, Abu, Abu Abdurrahman as sulami may God have mercy on him, say, I heard al Hussein bin Yahya say, I heard Ja'far bin Muhammad bin Nusair al-Khuldi say, I heard al-Junaid say, Abu Sulaiman al-Darani said, whenever a word of spiritual wisdom enters my heart, I would not accept it unless it is confirmed by two just witnesses, the holy book and the Prophet wasallam's custom. Abu Sulaiman said, the noblest of all deeds is to oppose the lusts of the soul. He said, each thing has its sign. The sign of forgetfulness of God is when one stops crying. He said, each thing has its own rust. The rust on the heart's light is when one's belly is full. He said, whatever distracts you from God most high, be it wealth or a child, brings you misfortune. Abu Sulaiman also said, one cold night, I was praying in front of a, of a mihrab. Cold began to bother me and I hid one hand from cold while leaving the other one exposed. Then sleep overcame me and I heard a voice, Abu, Sul Abu Sulaiman, 
we have already bestowed upon this one what he deserves. If only there were the other one so that we could do the same to it. I then swore to myself that I would never pray without exposing both hands, whether it be cold or warm. Abu Sulaiman said, once I overslept my personal prayer, all of a sudden I saw a maiden of paradise who said to me, you sleep while I am, while I am being prepared for you in the female chamber for 500 years. Abdullah bin Yusuf, Sari as Sakati Rahimahullah Ta'ala informs us of the following characteristics of the Sufis. <laughs> they refuse to act for the fulfillment of their egos or to obtain anything that has a taste of willfulness, lust, pleasure, or whim. They are able to resist commands of their egos. They firmly pursue five goals, never to be envious of what other people have, never to trouble other people, and always to control their hands, stomachs, and their sexual desires. They are humble and they follow the ones who are superior to them in mystical knowledge. They turn away from five evils, from everything that is temporal, from people, from desires, from wish, from the wish to be leaders, from the love of being praised. They wish for five gifts, that little of this world be given to them, but that the tr truth be given to them, that the fear of Allah be given to them, and that the company of the ones close to Allah be given to them, and that they be saved from the company of the ones who oppose Allah, and that they be given the ability to know and do things that please Allah, and that they receive that uh, the, the, they receive the things rejected by the ignorant. Junaid rahimahullah ta'ala went one morning, one, went early one morning to see Sari as Saqati. Sari told him, Abu Qasim, tonight I was given a little inspiration and my, uh, in, and my soul and was told, O oh, Sari, I created men and they were bound to me and they were coming to me. When I showed them the world, Nine tenths of them became world bound and one tenth remained with me. When I told them about paradise, nine tenths of those who remained desired paradise and only one tenth remained with me. When I poured my troubles and my pains <laughs> um, and my pains upon those who had stayed with me, they cried for help and nine tenths left and only one tenth remained with me. I told them you neither wanted the world nor paradise, nor did you run away from my troubles and pain. They said, you know what we desire. I said, I will pour upon you such calamities that the mountains could not bear their weight. They said, as long as they come from you, it is well with us. Yahya <clears throat> bin Mu'adh, Yahya uh, bin Ma'ad al-Razi um, said, Rahimahullah ta'ala, a Gnostic is a man who is both with creation and separated from it. He also said the Gnostic leaves the world without having fulfilled his aim in two things, weeping over himself and praising his Lord glorious and majestic. He, Rahimahullah ta'ala, said the most difficult thing for the murid is to mix with those who oppose him. He rahimahullah ta'ala said, if the Gnostic abandons the correct behavior with the object of his Gnosis, then surely he will perish along with the doomed. He also said, the one who is well versed in correct behavior towards God will become one of those God who God loves. He rahimahullah ta'ala said, the saints are the servants clothed with intimacy with God Most High after suffering and who embrace rest after striving when they arrive at the station of sainthood. He rahimahullah ta'ala said, the saint does, not, does nothing for the sake of men's approval, nor is he hypocritical. He rahimahullah ta'ala said, the saint is, fragrant is a fragrant plant placed on the earth by God. The truthful, the truthful take in his fragrance and it comes into their hearts so that they long for their master. Then they increase in worship according to their different natures. <clears throat> 
He rahimahullah ta'ala said the inner truth of poverty faqr, is, is that the servant is independent of all except God and it is its sign is the absence of all property. Someone asks of all poverty. Someone asked what is poverty. He said fear of poverty. The man inquired what is wealth. He replied security with God most high. <coughs> He rahimahullah ta'ala said, neither poverty nor wealth will carry weight on the day of reckoning. Only patience and thankfulness will be weighed. Thus it will be said, he is thankful and he is patient. He rahimahullah ta'ala said, one single lapse after repentance is more dreadful than 70 before it. He rahimahullah ta'ala said, <coughs> O oh my Lord, I do not say I have repented. I do not return to you because of what I uh, what I know to be my disposition. I do not swear that I will not sin again, for I know my own frailty. I do not say that I return to you because I might die before truly returning. He, rahimahullah ta'ala, in respect of his seclusion said, consider whether your intimacy is with retreat or with him in retreat. If your intimacy is with retreat, it will vanish when you emerge from it. If your intimacy is with him in retreat, everywhere will seem as one to you, whether the, desert, whether the deserts or the steppes. He, rahimahullah ta'ala, said, solitude is the companion of the voracious, he, rahimahullah ta'ala, said there are two kinds of abstaining. Abstaining in the external sense is that there is there be no outward movement except for God Most High, and in abstaining in the internal sense that the, that is that nothing other than God will enter your heart. He, rahimahullah ta'ala, said, one will not attain true renunciation until he possesses the qualities, action without attachment, speaking without ambition, and glory without having power over men. He rahimahullah ta'ala said the world is like the unveiled bride. The one who seeks the world becomes her lady's maid, and the one who renounces it blackens her face with soot, tears out her hair, and sets her dress on fire. The Gnostic preoccupied with God does not even turn his face in her direction. He rahimahullah ta'ala said, Poor son of Adam, if he feared the fire as much as he fears poverty, he would enter paradise. He rahimahullah ta'ala said, The hope that I place in you, O God, when I sin, is almost greater than the hope that I place in you when I perform good words. This is because when I perform good works, I find myself relying upon my sincerity in performing them. But how can I guard my work from faults? Who I who am marked with fault? When I engage in sin, I find myself relying on your forgiveness. How can you not forgive my sins, you who have the attribute of generosity? He rahimahullah ta'ala said, if one could purchase hunger in the marketplace, then the seeker of the hereafter would not need to buy anything else there. He rahimahullah ta'ala said, hunger is a light and filling one's stomach is a fire. Passion is like firewood from which fire arises, never to subside until it consumes its owner. He rahimahullah ta'ala said, arrogance is arrogance towards one who is arrogant to you on account of his property is humility. He rahimahullah ta'ala said, let the Muslims benefit from you be uh, from let the Muslims benefit from you by these qualities. If you cannot be helpful to him, then do not harm him. If you cannot bring him del delight, then do not cause him sorrow. If you cannot praise him, then do not find fault with him. He rahimahullah ta'ala said, for the man who is ashamed before God when he is obedient, God is ashamed to punish him after he has sinned. He rahimahullah ta'ala said, I would rather have a mustard seed's worth of love than 70 years of worship performed without love. He rahimahullah ta'ala said, death is like unto a bridge that joins the devotee to his beloved Lord. He rahimahullah ta'ala said, a moment's faith washes clean the sins of 200 years. He rahimahullah ta'ala said, since the lover of God commits sins only when he is besides himself, 
how can he be held responsible for them? He rahimahullah, he rahimahullah ta'ala said, to worry about the affairs of the past and to be preoccupied with the affairs of the future takes the blessing out of life. He who is rich, through the, through the grace of the name of the Lord is really rich. He who is rich through effort is ever poor. He rahimahullah ta'ala said, whoever eats much falls a prey to passion in an empty stomach settles the grace of the Lord and his, uh, and his effulgence, his light. <laughs> he rahimahullah ta'ala said, beware of dining at the table of the rich. He rahimahullah ta'ala said, a devotee's heart gets settled at any of the following four places and nowhere else, i.e. in solitude, in the mosque, in the graveyard, and in the wilderness. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Bismillah, Muhammad. <laughs> Revival of the religious sciences. Elm. Elm is the science of religion, the science of the knowledge of God and his verses. When the Caliph Omar died, Hazrat Ibn Mas'ud exclaimed, Nine tenths of the science of religion have passed away. The people, the present people, used the term Elm to mean the science of those who can well debate the cases of jurisprudence with their adversaries and those who cannot do that are termed weak and outside of the category of the learned men. But what has been said about the excellence of learning and the merits of the learned man apply to those who are versed according to the former meaning. Tawheed, unity of God. The present meaning of Tawheed is scholastic, is scholastic theology or elm kalam, the knowledge of the methods of argumentation. The manner of, confrontate, of confronting adversaries. Tawheed was then the belief that all things come from God and it ruled out all intermediary causes. The belief that good and evil all come from God and that the result of Tawheed is God reliance. Such people believe that another fruit of Tawheed is to avoid complaints to, pe to the people, not to get angry at them, and to remain satisfied with the decree of God. Another fruit of Tawheed is the saying of Hazrat Abu Bakr in his illness. The people said to him, let us call a physician for you. He said, the physician himself has given me this disease. In, in another narration, he said, the physician said, I certainly do what I wish. Tawheed is therefore a precious fruit which is engaged into several husks. The outer husk is distant from the inner. The modern people have taken up the husk and given up the pith. The people have termed it as the science of husk and given up the science of pith. The meaning of the husk of Tawheed is to utter by tongue, there is no deity but God. It is opposite to Trinity of the Christians. The hypocrite Muslims also utter it. The pith of Tawheed is confirmation by heart what the tongue confesses. The heart believes it to be true. This is real Tawheed, which is to entrust every affairs of man to God in such a way that his attention is not diverted to any other matter except to God. Those who follow their passion do not conform to this monotheism. God says, have you seen such one who takes his passion as God? The Prophet wasallam said, the worst deity in the sight of God that is worshipped in the, in the world is the deity of passion. Idol worship is also done according to the wishes of passion. For this reason, the soul of such a man inclines towards the religion of his ancestors. Such a man is like one who rises up in the morning and says, facing the Kaaba, I have turned my face towards one who created the heavens and the earth. But he really does not turn his heart towards God and begins the day with a lie. 
the direction of the Kaaba is not the direction of God. He who he who turns his face towards the Kaaba can't be called to have turned his face towards God, as God is not confined within space and direction. Mind is the mind of Tawheed and its fountainhead. A man of Tawheed turns his mind towards God and not towards any other direction. Dikr or Tazkir, God's remembrance. This is the science of invocation and admonition. God says, remind them because dhikr or admonition benefits the believer. There are many traditions regarding the merits of the assemblies of dhikr. The Prophet wasallam said, when you pass by the garden of paradise, enjoy yourselves. He, he was asked, what are the gardens of paradise? He said, assemblies of dhikr, remembrance of God. The Prophet wasallam said, the angels of God roam in the horizon except the angel of creation. When they see any assembly of dhikr, they accost themselves and say, come unto your goals. They then come to the place, surround them and hear them. Remember God and take lessons. Now the assembly of dhikr means the assembly of lectures wherein the modern lecturers deliver long speeches, tell stories, recite poems and poetries and sing songs. Such was not the practice at the time of the four rightly guided caliphs. Storytelling is an innovation. Ibn Umar once came out of the mosque exclaiming, none has sent me out except a sto storyteller. Hazrat Ali Karamallahu turned out the storytellers from the congregational mosque of Basra. He did not turn out Hassan Basri as he used to deal with the hereafter, contemplating contemplation of death, defects of soul, machinations of the devil. Such is the assembly about which the Prophet ﷺ said, to be present at the assembly of dhikr is better than 1,000 raka'ah of prayers, visiting 1,000 sick men and attending 1,000 funerals. Hazrat Atta said, one assembly of dhikr expiates the sins of 70 assemblies of useless talks. The Prophet ﷺ once heard three talks from Abdullah bin Rawaha and said, O Abu, Rawa Rah o Abu Rawaha, keep yourself far from ornamental talks. He asked the Prophet ﷺ one day about the blood money of a child which died in the womb of its mother, saying, how shall we pay the blood with wit of a child who has taken no food, no drink, nor cried, nor breathed? Such murder is excusable. The Prophet ﷺ said, Are you like the desert Arabs who indulge in ornamental words? Poetry. As to poetry, its general use in the sermons is bad. God says, as to poets, those who go astray follow them. Don't you find the wandering in every valley and say what they do not do? God said, I did not teach him, the Prophet ﷺ, poetry, nor it is becoming of him. Furthermore, what is narrated of poetries is sermons comprising mostly of love episodes descriptions of the beauties of the beloved, the joys of union and pangs of separation. This gives a, ri a rise to lust and sexual passion more than religious enthusiasm. There are, however, such poetries which contain wisdom. The Prophet ﷺ also said there is wis wisdom in poetry. Hikmah. The word hakim, derived from the word hikmah, is now used in the case of physicians, astrologers, and those who tell the future of the people by examining hands. But God says about the word hikmah, wisdom, he gives wisdom whom to whom he wishes. 
Whoever has been given wisdom has been given a great good. The Prophet ﷺ said, If a man learns a word of wisdom, it is better than the world and what it contains. Now think what was hik hikmah and what it has come to. Now think also of the meaning of many words which have come down to us. One day a man asked the Prophet ﷺ, Who is the worst creature in creation? The Prophet ﷺ said, O oh God, pardon me. On being repeatedly asked, the Prophet ﷺ replied, They are wicked, learned men. Now you have come to know about praiseworthy and blameworthy sciences and how they intermingled with one another. Now choose either of the two. If you want good, you may follow the path of the ancient sage, sages and saints. And if, and if you want, you may follow the paths of the latter generations. All knowledge which the ancient sages loved have vanished. The Prophet ﷺ said, Islam began with a few and it will soon return to a few as it began. Goodness to those few. He was asked, who are those few? He said, those who purify my sunnah after the people polluted them and those who revive my sunnah after their death. In another narration, the few are a few righteous people in the midst of many unrighteous men. <coughs> Third, <laughs>